In 2013, Greg Elwell wrote in the Oklahoma Gazette that lobster is fancy. If you can imagine a lobster talking, it probably has a British accent, he wrote. But 390 years earlier, the governor of Plymouth Colony, William Bradford, could not have disagreed more. When new colonists arrived in 1623, he was embarrassed that the only food they had in abundance was lobster. He lamented, the best dish people could present their friends was lobster or a piece of fish without any bread or anything other than a cup of spring water. Today, the stuff that we call Maine lobster is considered a delicacy, and the farther you are from the U.S. East Coast, the more expensive it is. But that wasn't always the case. When Europeans first arrived in the Americas, lobster was so plentiful that it was pretty much unwanted. And how it transformed from a food unfit for guests to the food that you eat on a fancy date had to do with changes in technology and culture as Americans crossed the continent. The history of how lobster became a main dish is history that deserves to be remembered. Ancient Romans and other cultures of the Mediterranean Sea seem to have eaten lobsters of several species, both spiny lobsters and the common lobster, which is similar to the American lobster. Other creatures called lobsters are eaten in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, such as rock lobsters, ornate lobsters, and slipper lobsters, although they lack the large claws of true lobsters and are not closely related. They're all arthropods and in the order Decapoda because they have ten legs. Frequently called bugs of the sea, the Romans gave them the name Locusta, literally the same thing they called locusts. Perhaps surprisingly, the online etymology dictionary says that the word was used first for lobsters and then extended to locusts, thanks to a passing resemblance. It's not certain how Locusta became the word lobster, but one suggestion is that it combined with the Old English term lapa, meaning spider, to become the modern lobster or in the R-dropping dialect of Eastern New England English, lobster. The earliest known depiction of a lobster was in 15th century BC Egypt. The Greek scholar Aristophanes described lobsters as excellent food. They're in some of the earliest cookbooks. Romans considered them a delicacy to be served to the wealthy. Pliny described a spiny lobster that was more than two meters long, much larger than any modern specimen. In the Middle Ages, lobsters were considered to have medicinal value and were also considered to be an aphrodisiac. One of the defining characteristics of lobsters as food is that they are difficult to transport. Shortly after death, bacteria in the lobster's flesh multiply and release toxins, giving diners an unpleasant case of food poisoning. It happens quickly enough that lobsters still have to be transported live to be safe to eat, and then either boiled alive or killed immediately before cooking. For most of human history, that meant that lobsters were only eaten close to the shore, where they could take them alive from the sea and cook them almost immediately. In Europe, lobsters were cheaply caught and easy protein for many hard-scrabble coastal villages from the Mediterranean to the coast of England. While a delicacy in ancient Rome, in many parts of Europe, they were simply food and abundant enough to be eaten often. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church instituted a policy of abstaining from meat on Fridays, the day that Jesus was killed, as a way to honor his sacrifice. Meat included, however, only the flesh of warm-blooded animals, and therefore not fish, which included the lobster. This requirement drove an increased demand for seafood. In the 1400s, the Bishop of Salisbury purchased 42 different types of crustaceans in a single nine-month period, and Henry VIII regularly ate lobster. By the 7th century, they were being painted as symbols of opulence. The opinions of early American colonists was starkly different. The American lobster was more than abundant in the 17th century. It was ubiquitous. Lobsters washed up on shore in huge piles and were so plentiful that Native Americans used them as fertilizer or fish bait. The indigenous people also ate them, cooking them in sand pits that would inspire the much later tradition of New England clam bakes. In 1654, one writer noted that lobsters plenty makes them little esteemed and seldom eaten, and the Native Americans only ate them when they can get no bass. Another said that the least boy could get his fill of lobster easily. An enduring legend is that indentured servants, slaves, or prisoners were fed lobster so often that they protested until their masters were forced to sign contracts to agree to only serve lobster two or three times a week. Despite many assured references, there is no contemporary evidence that any servants complained of eating lobster too much. But still, in the early and difficult years of American colonization of New England, lobster was probably the most abundant and easy to obtain protein. The consequence was that lobster wasn't a luxury. Almost anyone could get a lobster dinner. Maine was first visited by Europeans in 1524 when Giovanni de Verrazzano passed by briefly. 
Next came Esteban Gomez, who had sailed with Magellan, but deserted the voyage with the crew of the San Antonio. He sailed to the New World, seeking the Northwest Passage, a better route to the Orient. He identified the Penobscot River as that passage, and abducted around 50 natives before returning to Spain. It wasn't until 1605 that the first confirmed report of a European catching and eating an American lobster appears. Captain George Weymouth of the Archangel, with the hopes of establishing a colony in Virginia. One of Weymouth's crew reported that on May 21st they drug a net and got about 30 very good and great lobsters. Lobster was usually cooked boiled or baked, and in a 1685 cookbook from London, there's a recipe for boiled lobsters eaten cold in the common way. They were also hidden in sauces, minced, but rarely was it a main course. British cookbook writer Hannah Glassa was the first to put boiled and split or roasted lobster as a main dish, dressed up with sauces, butter, lemon, or wine. Lobsters of the 1600s were also considerably larger than the ones that we now eat. A colonist in Salem in 1630 reported that lobsters weighed between 16 and 25 pounds, while most eaten today are between 1 and 4 pounds. The stigma attached to lobsters remained through American independence, and in 1876 one writer said that lobster shells about a house are looked upon as signs of poverty and degradation. In the late 1700s, American lobstermen started using boats called smacks, which had open holding wells on deck that circulated external water, which provides enough oxygen to keep the lobsters alive until they reach the shore. Live lobsters could only be sold where they could be physically brought, and for Maine lobsters that meant New England, as far south as Philadelphia. A three-pound lobster in the 1870s only cost about three cents. In the 1840s, lobster canneries began opening in Maine, with one pound can selling for about five cents, but early cannings had problems with spoilage, which led to the saying that lobster was green in the sea, red in the pot, and black in the can. In the early days, canneries considered a four or five pound lobster too small to bother with. By the 1880s, canneries in Maine were processing millions of pounds of meat. At the time, a can of baked beans sold for 53 cents a pound, but lobster only sold for 11 cents a pound. Inexpensive canned food was in huge demand during the Civil War as a means of supplying the large army with non-perishable foods, transforming the logistics of feeding an army. Demand and the importance of the resource to the Maine economy drove some of the first regulations on lobster fishing. In 1828, Maine banned out-of-state lobstermen. In 1872, the state turned to conservation, passing the first law that banned the taking of egg-bearing females. 1874 brought the first rules regarding the minimum size of caught lobsters at 10.5 inches of overall size, measured from just behind the eyes to the end of the tail. These rules brought down the cannery business in the state, with many of them moving north to Canada, where the rules were more lenient. Advancements within the industry helped to make live lobster viable as a large enterprise as fishing pushed lobsters away from the shore. The first lobster pound opened in Maine in 1876. A pound is a large enclosure with circulating water that holds lobsters pending sale. Some were net enclosures in the seawater, while more modern ones hold lobsters in baskets and are irrigated directly from the sea. The American lobster trap was first invented by Ebenezer Thorndike in 1808 and became widely used over the 19th century. Increased production couldn't change public sentiment, but in a short time those views would change. In 1887, Richard Rathburn of the Smithsonian said, Lobsters are among the most highly esteemed of the sea products of our Atlantic coast and are everywhere in great demand for food. Several developments underwrote this shift. The first was the railroad. The first railroad in Maine was laid between Old Town and Bangor in 1836, and expanding networks made it possible for live lobsters to be packed on ice and shipped inland within a two-day journey by locomotive. Railroads also provided a market for canned lobster, extremely cheap and to inland customers, free of the stigma it had on the coast. Railroads also made it possible for thousands of tourists to visit seaside resorts, where many ate lobster for the first time. The 1850s saw lobster appearing on menus throughout New England. An 1884 cookbook from Boston included recipes for lobster bisque and chowder, as well as cutlets, deviled, curried, scalloped, and stewed lobster. Perhaps just as importantly, lobster became the meal of choice for the wealthy, and the Rockefellers, who brought a summer home in Maine in 1910, helped popularize it as a must-have delicacy. Tourists who sampled fresh lobster demanded more. In the last two decades of the 19th century, the price of a pound of lobster quadrupled. By the 1920s, lobster had become a luxury dish and reached a price peak. Around the same time, overfishing had begun to take a toll. Between 1910 and 1916, lobster landings fell by nearly 50%. In 1917, a new law was passed allowing egg-bearing females from pounds to be sold to wardens who returned them to the sea to prevent the eggs from being scrubbed and the lobster sold illegally. 
This became the practice of V-notching, in which egg-producing females have a V cut out of their tails, so other lobstermen knew to leave them be for the sake of the industry. All was well until 1929, when the Depression hit and took luxury items with it. During the Depression, French lobster was rare, and canned lobster again became a symbol of poverty. Especially in the Northeast, poor families could still get lobster easily, and poor children on the coast ate lobster for lunch. The proverbial train, however, came back around during World War II. While canned lobster made the rounds as a military ration, fresh lobster was considered a delicacy and therefore was not rationed. It became a luxury again, if only because it was available, regaining its former position as an indulgence. Conservation has long been a concern for the industry. In 1867, Maine established the Department of Sea and Shore Fisheries in charge of governing lobster fishery. In 1917, this group created a Director of Sea and Shore Fisheries, which made its first report in 1918. That report examined a feeling of antagonism on the part of the dealers and the fishermen, and sought to nurture the relationship. The department evolved in today's Department of Marine Resources, which is now also charged to develop marine and estuary resources, as well as promote Maine fishery industries. In 1988, the minimum size of lobsters was increased when scientists determined that 90% of lobsters were being caught before ever mating. The maximum size has kept large lobsters who produce more eggs in the breeding population. Wire mesh traps were first used in 1956, and while similar in design, are much lighter and more resistant to air. The 1950s also brought better refrigeration technology and air freight. Pressurized cabins allowed lobster to be put on ice and flown even further, helping to begin a worldwide market. In 1936, Emile Petrul began freezing lobsters in what was called a popsicle pack, a whole cooked lobster frozen with saltwater brine. Cryogenic freezing was introduced in the 1980s. The technology offers a deeper freeze which allows longer shipping times and have allowed frozen lobster products to proliferate. Since the 2000s, there's been an ongoing conflict over labeling lobsters. The controversy was largely centered around the meat of the langostino, a type of squat lobster that is neither a true lobster nor a prawn. The seafood chain Long John Silvers was forced to revise a marketing campaign for failing to clarify that a product used langostino lobster instead of Maine lobster. According to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, only American lobster may be simply labeled lobster in marketing. Representatives from Maine still disagree with restaurants being allowed to use the word lobster attached to langostinos, something commonly done with things like appetizers and pasta sauces. While the rule has not changed, the controversy, according to a 2006 report on National Public Radio, has left a lot of people steamed. The discussion demonstrates the importance of the United States' most valuable seafood sector. The U.S. lobster industry made $684.3 million in sales in 2018. In recent years, lobster landings have reached all-time highs, with some 286 million live pounds reported in 2018. The view of lobster that changes over time has largely been a result of culture. Whether you think that lobster is food for the poor or for the rich largely depends upon when and where you live. And that calculation is more complex than a simple measurement of supply versus demand. Access, technology, simply who was eating the food at the time, and of course, marketing have all impacted the developing image of lobsters. It might seem a trivial point, but it's important for us all to realize that even things that we take for granted are impacted by a history that affects things like what we might take for granted. Like the idea that lobster is fancy. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guy. Short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow the History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.